Bath and this is the third of three short videos looking at the needs of the children that we look after. Uh, these are children that have usually experienced abuse, neglect and other forms of trauma. In the first of the videos we looked at the first core need which is the need to feel safe. We looked at different aspects of that need to feel safe, uh, the need to be physically safe, emotionally safe, socially and culturally safe as well. In the second of the videos we looked at the need for healthy connections uh, and that includes connections with the normal community. So, so much has happened to these kids in their lives um, and they often don't feel normal so I think it's important that they are connected with normal people, normal activities and so they can start to feel normalized as well. And these kids also have a need to be connected with the adult caregivers because we know that their experiences have led to them lacking trust, uh, particularly in other adults, and the need to establish trust-based connections with adults is a critical one. We also talked about Lisa, uh, a young kid that um, when I was a house parent uh, we used to look after and she came into care about 12 and when she was about 13 there was this incident where she went out and got drunk. Um, and our responses to that incident uh, entirely missed the meaning of her behaviours, what was driving the behaviours, the emotions behind it. Instead of focusing on what her needs were, we focused on trying to correct the behaviours. And so we're looking today at the third core need. I want to start with just looking at some of the research on the needs of kids in care. We know that being exposed to trauma, especially early in life, can lead to problems in many areas of development. Uh, for example, we know that uh, development can be affected in the following ways. We know that attachment can be affected. We know that social skills uh, are problematic with these kids. We know that their physical health, uh, especially over their lifetime, will be more problematic than kids who haven't been exposed to trauma. Um, we know there's a difficulty around the control of emotions and impulses, the control of behaviours. We know that thinking skills can be affected. Things like self-concept, self-belief, shame and guilt are affected and many of these kids lack a positive view of the future. But there's one of these areas of development that really stands out from the others. Uh, one that has sometimes been called the core experience of trauma. And I'll just read what two of the experts in the field say. So here's Alan Shaw. He says this, the most significant consequence of early trauma is the child's failure to develop the capacity to self-regulate the intensity and the duration of emotional states. And Bessel van der Kolk says this, at the core of traumatic stress is a breakdown in the capacity to regulate internal states. So what does that mean for us that are looking after these kids? Well, often it means that a little bit of frustration quickly becomes a rage. It could mean that a little bit of sadness becomes despair. Fear, a little bit of anxiety, becomes a fear or even a terror. Moods can swing up and down, can be triggered very easily, negative moods. And sometimes feelings like loss and shame overwhelm the kids. They have difficulty regulating, keeping emotions in balance. Some kids cope by clamping down on feelings, shutting them down building impenetrable emotional walls so that they don't, they don't feel vulnerable. You'll sometimes hear older kids say, I've learned not to feel good. I've learned not to trust others. Or, or I won't allow myself to love someone. It's part of this being emotionally protective. So managing emotions is a key issue with kids in care, but so is managing all the other impacts of trauma. The emotions, the thoughts, the feelings, the sensations. So much so that 
Louis Cozzolino tells us this about kids in care. He said, the traumatized child is drowning in a sea of fragmented and overwhelming emotions, sensations and frightening thoughts. So how do children cope? Well, I'm sure you'd be familiar with some of the ways that children cope with overwhelming inner turbulence. For example, uh, sometimes they avoid contact with the caregivers or anything that reminds them of things that they're afraid of. Uh, sometimes they withdraw. Sometimes they cling to the caregivers. Sometimes they seek to control interactions and decisions and things that involve them. Sometimes they retreat into fantasy. They sometimes get aggressive, for example. And as kids go, grow older, they have more things that they can do. Some of them are helpful, some of them aren't helpful. But some of the things we grapple with with kids, like we grappled with, with Lisa, are things like the use of substances as a way of coping. Uh, some of these kids are more able to run away, for example, and not stay engaged. Um, and others uh, self-harm and use that as a way of coping with overwhelming feelings. It comes down to a way of seeing. Are these problem behaviours, challenging behaviours, bad behaviours, or are they ways of coping? Sandra Bloom, who is one of the uh, you know, great figures in the field of trauma, tells us this. She says, the things we call symptoms or behavioural problems are the best solutions our children have been able to come up with to help them manage unendurable feelings. Whatever they are doing, it is, or at least it was, a useful coping skill, which over time may have become maladaptive, that's not helpful, or may have become a habit. So how can we help the young people we care for develop helpful and useful coping strategies that won't do harm to them in the longer run. Well, there's a couple of points. The first point is this. The research tells us very clearly that learning to manage emotions is much more to do with the availability of support, coaching, and trust in caregivers than it does to do with the personal effort of the kids involved. It's very, very difficult to learn how to manage turbulent emotions if you don't have close and warm and attuned support from your caregiver. So that's an important thing, uh, an important principle to bear in mind. There are two very basic strategies that we can use to help kids manage with internal turbulence. The first has to do with a skill called active listening. Now, I'm not going to go through active listening. I'm just going to talk about one component skill, which the research is telling us is very, very helpful with children. And it is to do with the naming of emotions. If we can actually put a name to the emotional state of the child, we can help, help them deal with the emotional stress. The research tells us that naming a problem emotion actually reduces the intensity of that emotion. For example, you can say something like this, I see that you're feeling very angry with Martha at the moment. Or, you seem sad that your mum didn't come when she said she was going to come. It sounds simple, but just giving a name to the emotion reduces the intensity of that emotion. It's even better if we can encourage the children to name the emotions themselves. For example, what were you feeling when your mum didn't come? Or were you sad or were you angry when that happened? And in that way encouraging the child to reflect on what's happening internally and put a name to it. As I said, it sounds simple, but the research is telling us that what happens in the brain is that the threat detection system in the brain starts to calm down when a name is given to the emotion. There's a second way that we can help kids that are really struggling 
with difficult emotions, thoughts and impulses. And it's what parents do with small infants. Parents lend their calmness to the child when the, car, the child has run out of the ability to control the emotion. They don't use threats, they don't use consequences. What they do is try and understand what is motivating the behaviour and then they try to address that need. Instead of making the kid feel more stressed, they use calm tones of voice, they use their physical presence and they do what they can to reduce the intensity of the emotion rather than increase the intensity. Unfortunately, as children get older, we start to do the opposite. When children are upset or they start swearing, uh, they start perhaps kicking things, really struggling with containing a difficult emotion, our instinct is to start directing them, telling them they've got to stop this behaviour and if they continue the behaviour, there will be a consequence for it. We call that coercive regulation. In other words, the adult is trying to control the child. And it's the opposite to what a parent does with a small infant, which is co-regulation, is working together with the child to calm down. Let's return to Lisa. If you, if you remember that when Lisa came in, my instinct was to, to uh, tell her off, to lecture her, uh, and to give her a consequence for her bad choices of behaviour. Uh, instead of focusing on the emotions that were driving what she did. In the following slide, we can see the difference between coercive regulation and co-regulation. Co-regulation involves a two-way engagement, not just a one-way intervention. With coercive regulation, we just focus on behaviours, like we did with Lisa. With co-regulation, we focus on the feelings that are driving the behaviour. With coercive regulation, usually the tone of voice is quite different, the non-verbals. For instance, just the, the harshness of the tone, because we're ordering the child or we're wanting them to stop doing what they're doing. But with co-regulation, we make an effort to speak in a soothing tone. It might be assertive, but it's soothing. It helps to calm the child. Um, with coercive regulation, um, we sometimes retaliate to the child's hostility. We tell them, don't speak to me like that. But with co-regulation, we absorb the child's hostility. In other words, we don't focus on the hostility, we focus on what can we do to help them calm down. And of course, at the end, we're looking at meeting the child's need, providing support to the child, whereas with coercive regulation, we're not particularly interested in what support the child needs. So there's a big difference between being coercive with a child and co-regulating with them. Sometimes firm boundaries are needed. Sometimes a kid has just learnt a bad behaviour. Sometimes it's a bad habit. Sometimes they might just be following what other kids are doing. Sometimes uh, clear boundaries will need to be set. That's usually where the child is doing something that's unsafe or that will be harmful to the child or to other children. Bessel van der Gogh says, some children will one day need therapy. Some may be able to face doing formal therapy, some may not be able to face formal therapy. Bessel van der Kolk says this, the first order of business is to find ways to cope with feeling overwhelmed by sensations and emotions <clears throat> associated with the past. So we've now looked at the three core needs. Of course, these aren't all the needs that children have. They've got many, many other needs, uh, and they've got needs that are similar to all other children. Uh, during development. But these are the three core needs and they're the three core needs that are associated with the experience of trauma. And just to review, the first one is the need to feel safe. The second one is the need for healthy connections. Connections with the normal community and connections with caring adults. And the third need is to be able to find healthy and adaptive ways to cope with overwhelming feelings from the past. 
So I hope that this quick review of the three core needs has been helpful and I wish you the very best in your vital work with these vulnerable children. Thank you.